Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Minwi Maitri. Be a good person and go to heaven. And that doesn't normally sound like something we talk about in Buddhism. Uh, and yet that's exactly what the Buddha talked about when lay practitioners come and say, okay, we're following you. We're doing what we should do. Um, you know, what should we expect? What, do we, what else do we need to do? How do we need to meditate? You know, what lies in store for us? Um, the Buddha would discuss these things frequently with lay practitioners. Not all of his sermons or not all of his suttas that he gave uh, were directed at the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. Not all of them were directed at uh, the order of monastics. A lot of them were directed to uh, his kinfolk or other people he would run into uh, while he was on his journeys who would come uh, who led a normal life, but uh, decided to uh, follow the Buddha and, and follow his teachings. They, they found that it led to a better life for them. So I, uh, like I said, so I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story. So last fall, uh, after the time changed, uh, and I was not able to come and sit with, with the Sangha, uh, weekly because it just fell right into the middle of when I was getting my son to school. Uh, and so um, behind getting him dressed and fed and onto the motorcycle and driving him to school, that, that's that whole hour uh, during the time change. So that was a little difficult for me. So I found myself uh, wanting to study the, the Dharma, um, but not really having it outlet here uh, to do so besides self-study and you know I have my own meditation practice and such so uh, I decided to do something that I had never done before and uh, I studied a different meditation uh, tradition uh, and this I studied a meditation tradition uh, with an orthodox Jewish rabbi um, and their their tradition of, of Kabbalah or um, of, of a little bit more modern translation of that through the Tanya. And uh, I found so many similarities that as the rabbi would teach me these things, I'd be like, I believe that as a Buddhist. I believe that that's exactly what I always thought, you know, because the concept of what we think of as Buddha nature, that overarching ontological, cosmological um, functioning of the universe, um, they roll into a, a being that they call God um, or Hashem, as they might call their God. Uh, Elohim, they have many names. Um, but it all rolls into this overarching uh, nature nature of the universe, nature, like I said, this ontological uh, description. And, uh, and yet for uh, the end goal, the end result of what uh, good Orthodox Jews want is to go to heaven. And, uh, and that, that, description of heaven is not really strong. It's kind of, it's, it's not well-defined. Um, and yet it's very similar to something that the Buddha taught. And so I'm going to share with you a fairly short sutta tonight uh, that kind of goes over this. So in the Anguttara Nikaya, uh, in the Book of Sixes, um, there was a a time in which the Buddha had gone back to his, his homeland, the land of the Sakyans, and uh, he was practicing there. And one of his younger cousins came up to him. Uh, his name was Mahanama. 
Uh, not to be confused with the Mahanama, that was one of the first five uh, disciples of the Buddha and one of the first five arahants that sat and listened to the Buddha at Deer Park. Uh, but this was a younger cousin of his. And so he came to the Buddha and, uh, and he said, at one time the Buddha was staying in the land of the Sakyans near, Kapil, near Kapilvatu in the Indian Tree Monastery. Then Mahanama, the Sakyan, went up to the Buddha, bowed, sat down on, to one side, and said to him, Sir, when a noble disciple has reached the fruit and understood the instructions, what kind of meditation do they frequently practice? So he was coming and saying, okay, I'm a good lay follower. I believe you. I've gone, to, I've gone for refuge. What, what type of meditation practice should I be practicing? Mahanama. When a noble disciple has reached the fruit and understood the instructions, they frequently practice this kind of meditation. Firstly, a noble disciple, disciple recollects the realized one. That blessed one is perfected, a fully awakened Buddha, accomplished in knowledge and conduct, holy, knower of the world, supreme guide for those who wish to train, teacher of gods and humans, awakened, blessed. When a noble disciple disciple recollects the realized one their mind is not full of greed hate and delusion at that time their mind is unswerving based on the realized one a noble disciple whose mind is unswerving finds inspiration in the meaning and the teaching and finds joy connected with the teaching when their joyful rapture springs up when the mind is full of rapture the body becomes tranquil when the body is tranquil they feel bliss and when they're blissful, the mind becomes immersed in samadhi. This is, called noble, this is called a noble disciple who lives in balance among the people who are unbalanced and lives untroubled among people who are troubled. They enter the stream of the teaching and develop the recollection of the Buddha. Furthermore, a noble disciple recollects the teaching, the Dharma, as we would say, or the Dhamma. The teaching is the well is well explained by the Buddha, apparent in the present life, immediately effective, inviting inspection, relevant, so that sensible people can know it for themselves. When a noble disciple recollects the teaching, their mind is not full of greed, hate, and delusion. This is called a noble disciple. And he goes on to say how they can, it, he repeats that phrase again and again, you know, they can live uh, with an untroubled mind in a troubled world, so to speak. And then he goes on again. And he, you see, he's going through the triple gems here as their method of meditation to recollect on the Buddha, the Dharma. And now he says to recollect on the Sama, Sangha. He says, furthermore, a noble disciple recollects the Sangha. The Sangha of the Buddhist disciples is practicing the way that's good, direct, systematic, and proper. It consists of the four pairs, the eight individuals. This is the Sangha of the Buddha's disciples that is worthy of offerings, dedicated to the gods, worthy of hospitality, worthy of religious donation, worthy of greeting with joined palms, and is the supreme field of merit for the world. When a noble disciple recollects the Sangha, their mind is not full of greed, hatred, and delusion. Again, he goes on about living a, a peaceful mind in an unpeaceful world, um, a uh, living an untroubled life in a troubled world. Uh, and then he goes on after those three things. And he says, furthermore, a noble disciple recollects their own ethical conduct, when his, which is unbroken, impeccable, spotless, and unmarred, liberating, praised by sensible people, not mistaken, and leading to immersion. When a noble disciple recollects their ethical conduct, their mind is not full of greed, hatred, and delusion. Again, he, he goes on. So he says, Meditate on the triple gym, and then meditate on your own ethical conduct. We would sometimes call that the precepts, right? Um, the, so we're, we're meditating on the good things um, that we have vowed to, to live our lives by. And then he goes on, furthermore, a noble disciple recollects their own generosity. I'm so fortunate, so very fortunate among people full of stain of stinginess. I live at home rid of stinginess, freely generous, open-handed, loving to let go, committed to charity, loving to give and to share. When a noble 
The disciple recollects on their own generosity, their mind is not full of greed, hate, and delusion, etc. And then finally, he talks about meditating on the gods. And this is something that we don't normally talk about in Buddhism. So again, I just wanted to bring this up. Furthermore, a noble disciple recollects the deities. There are the gods of the four great kings, the gods of the 33, the gods of Yama, the joyful gods, the gods who love to imagine, the gods who control what is imagined by others, the gods of Brahma's host, the gods even higher than those. When those deities passed away from here, they were reborn there because of their faith, ethics, learning, generosity, and wisdom. I, too, have had some kind of faith, ethics, learning, generosity, and wisdom. When a noble disciple recollects the faith, ethics, learning, generosity, and wisdom of both themselves and the deities, their mind is not full of greed, hate, and delusion. At that time, their mind is unswerving based on the deities. A noble disciple whose mind is unswerving finds inspiration in the meaning and the teaching and finds joy connected with the teaching. When your joyful rapture springs up, when the mind is full of rapture, the body becomes tranquil. When the body is tranquil, you feel bliss. And when you're blissful, the mind becomes immersed in samadhi. This is called a noble disciple who lives in balance among people who are unbalanced and lives untroubled among people who are troubled. They've entered the stream of the teaching and developed the recollection of the deities. When a noble disciple has reached the fruit, understood the instructions of this kind of meditation, they frequently practice. So in the Buddhist description of what a lay follower should do, he tells him, go into your meditative practice with a purpose. Meditate on the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. Meditate on your precepts and meditate on um, this wisdom that you gain by following the precepts, right? By your generosity. One of the great things that we talk about, we talk about dana in the Dharma. That's just generosity. So meditate on the generosity. And when you meditate on these things, and then he says, finally, meditate on the deities. And why is he telling people this? Because this is not... This is a lay follower. This is not someone who's come and joined the Sangha and lives outside of the world in their seclusive nature and uh, can only worry about never being reborn. He's telling these people that no them to be reborn. Be reborn in heaven. Meditate on the deities. Follow their example of good, of living a good life so that you can be reborn like they are reborn and become like the gods. So I think that's a very interesting interesting approach that the Buddha is giving to the lay follower. Again, he's not, he's not talking to the Sangha here uh, of people who have given up this, um, this normal life to take on the holy life, to dedicate their lives to ever being reborn, right? To alleviating all suffering. He's telling this to people who live a normal life, who live with their friends, their family, who live in a society with, um, in this case, temples, but but, you know, in our case, with churches and synagogues and, and other places of worship. And he's not saying you got to separate yourself from all their beliefs. The Dharma is bigger than that. The Dharma will allow you to find peace and bliss and harmony uh, by living in the world that you live in, but not being troubled like the world is troubled and not being, not being uh, trapped in the world's trappings because you're free from it because you have the Dharma. So I think that's great. Um, instruction that the Buddha gives to lay followers. And as I said earlier, when I was practicing, not really practicing, but studying uh, the meditative practices of, of Orthodox Judaism, uh, I found so many similarities there, you know, in practicing and meditating on, on generosity. Uh, and one of the things that I did, and I, I, I carry it over now into my, into my normal Dharma practice, is uh, one of the things that Orthodox Jews like to do is to create a, uh, a giving box, a charity box. And so at the beginning of each of their, uh, each of their acts of, uh, of duty, uh, of following a commandment, in this case, it would be like meditation. Uh, they'll put, you know, just a dollar or 50 cents or something here in Vietnam. We have lots of small currency. It's all bills. 
it was easy for me. And you drop it into a box. Uh, and that's, that whole concept is to set your, set your mind in a, in a generous, charitable giving uh, so that when you start your meditation practice or your prayers that they say or whatever, you've already started with the generosity. And the generosity sets your mind at, I want to help other people. And that's something that the Buddha was teaching here. Meditate on generosity. When you meditate on generosity, what a better person you will be. So again, uh, I just use that as an example. There's lots of uh, places where there's overlap in these meditation traditions. Um, but what's important, I think, to the lay practitioner is to understand that you can follow the Dharma and understand the world of the nature, the nature of the world and of the universe. Uh, the Buddha sets out a path for you to do that. And you don't have to be so focused to give up all of your life towards the Dharma. Uh, you can live your life um, like, like other people in your community uh, and still find the fruits of the Dharma. So uh, I hope that those of you who, uh, who are searching, who might be hearing this on YouTube or, or somewhere else, uh, that you realize there's a method out there. Meditate on those things that are important. Meditate on the deities, on your own version of God. Uh, and that will lead you to a better life and the happiness that the Buddha promises. Thank you.